Hello, I'm Shelley Quinn, and we are so glad you are joining us for 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We are students of the Bible. We study so we can share with you. You are what it's all about. Today, we will be looking at the judging process. Let me introduce you to the 3ABN family sitting at the table with me, Brother James Rafferty. Good to be here, Shelley. I have Monday's lesson, which is the pre-advent judgment. Amen and amen. And Brother John Dinsey. Thank you. It's a blessing to be here. I have Tuesday, the Millennial Judgment. That sounds great. Nice. Ryan Day. I have Wednesday's lesson entitled, The Executive Judgment. Oh, this is going to be mm. good. And my precious sister, Jill Morricone. Thank you, Shelley. I'm excited about this lesson. Thursday is the second death. Oh, it's going to be a beautiful study. Thank you for joining us. I hope you have your pen, your paper, and your Bible. But let's start with prayer. And James, would you like to open? Sure would. Father in heaven, just thank you for our audience. Thank you for the gift, the promise of your Holy Spirit. Yes. Thank you for your word. We're studying a very important subject, all the aspects of the judgment and the final uh, decree of the second death. We just pray that you will give us words to share and that you'll touch the hearts of each one that's listening. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Okay, lesson 13, the judging process. And our memory text is from 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. Mm -hmm. For we must all mm -hmm. appear before the judgment seat of mm -hmm. Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. You know, the Bible told us, uh, tells us, and we looked at it last week, in Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed for men to die once, yes. and then the judgment. God is love. God is righteous. That's his character. And because he is a righteous and loving God, mm -hmm. he has a system of justice. It is a perfect system of justice, mm -hmm. and it is so lacking in our world. But the Bible is clear both in the Old Testament and the New Testament that we are saved by grace through faith, but we are judged by God in accordance with what we've done while we're in the body. So Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says, God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, mm -hmm. whether good or bad. Jeremiah 17, 10, this is the Lord speaking. Mm -hmm. He said, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according mm. to the fruit of his doings. Did you know that we can't run, we can't hide from God? He is everywhere present. And he's not only transcendent above and beyond our physical realm, but he's an up close mm -hmm. and personal God. He his imminent presence is with us at all times. Listen to this, Psalm 139. David wrote this. Mm -hmm. It's such a beautiful psalm. It, it, I encourage you to read verses 1 through 7. We won't take the time to read that all now, but listen how he begins. O oh Lord, you have searched me mm -hmm. and known me. You know my actions. You understand my thoughts. You know my words. And then in verse 7, Psalm 139, verse 7, he says, where can I go from your spirit? Mm -hmm. Where can I flee from your presence? Mm -hmm. God knows everything right. about us. He even knows what we're thinking afar off before it even mm -hmm. comes to our mind. Mm -hmm. So he knows the life of every individual. And I have to tell you, he doesn't have to review our cases for judgment. <laughs> God already knows. What the judgment is all about is to accommodate the curiosity of his other created beings, those in heaven and earth who need to understand the history of Lucifer's rebellion, how it spread to all the world. And there's three main phases of God's judgment. There is a pre-advent judgment, and that's obvious even in Genesis. 
there is the millennial judgment and then there is an executive judgment. Mm -hmm. So the process of judgment is, it ends, let me put it this way, it ends well for us who are in Christ. Mm. The process of judgment ends with vindication That's right. of those who are in Christ, but it ends with the second death of the wicked. So let's mm -hmm. look at Sunday's lesson, the final judgment. As a result of judgment, before we begin, let me just say this. Let's remember we're saved by grace through faith. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, not of works that any of us can boast. There's nothing you and I can do to save ourselves. The Bible tells us we are just about justified by faith. We know that Abraham was justified by faith. That's Genesis 15, 6. And then Romans 5, 1, Paul repeats that and says, just as he was, so are you justified by faith. But we are judged very clearly by God appraising our works. Why? Works are the external evidence of a true experience of salvation. When God converts us, when we are born again, when we have His Holy Spirit indwelling us, we're going to be motivated to love the Lord and motivated to walk in obedience to our God. So when God ex executes His justice in judgment, judgment is a two sided coin. The judgment will bring condemnation on those who never repented or turned to God. Mm -hmm. That's one side of judgment. That's the scary side. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, mm -hmm. judgment brings vindication. Yes. Vindication to those who are made righteous mm -hmm. by faith. So 1 Kings 8.32 is talking about God judging His servants condemning the wicked, bringing his way on his head. Get that. It's the wicked who have determined what happens to them mm -hmm. in judgment. Mm -hmm. What happens is it brings his way on his head and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. I guess my favorite text on all, of all the judgment text mm. is Daniel 7, 21 and 22. Mm. Mm. That's my favorite. When Daniel says, I was watching until the Ancient of Days mm. came and a judgment was made in favor yes. of the saints of the Most High. Mm -hmm. If you're in Christ Jesus, you don't have to fear judgment. He says, and then the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Mm. So let's consider Matthew 25. We don't have time to read the entire passage, but it's Matthew 25, 31 through 46. You might want to note that. And what we see here, this is not a parable, but Jesus is describing the judgment in figurative language. He's talking about the condemnation and the vindication for those who did to the least of these or did not do to the least of these. Essentially, the figurative language that he uses to describe humanity is sheep and the goats. Mm. The sheep are the righteous, the goats are the unrighteous, the wicked. So this is a literal description of what's going to happen at his second coming. The Son of Man, the King, has already made his investigative judgment. His Before his second coming, the pre-advent judgment Christ has made. And he's ready to separate the sheep and the goats based on how they treated the least of these. He says that if we've walked in the humility of love with a commitment to Jesus and we're compassionate 
toward the least of these, providing them food or drink or shelter, clothing the naked, visiting them while they were sick or in prison. He says, that you did unto me. Mm. Now the goats, the unrighteous, ignored the needs mm. of these brothers. They walked in wicked selfishness and pride. And Jesus says in verse 40, this is Matthew 25, verse 40, and the king speaks and he says, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it, as, in as much as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. Mm -hmm. But in contrast, if we ignore the needs of others, Jesus says we're ignoring him. Mm. Isn't that scary? When we turn a blind eye to the needs of people, Jesus says we're turning a blind eye toward him. Mm. Mm. So he says in verse 46 that the goats will go into everlasting punishment but the righteous into eternal life. Mm. So John 3, 18, Jesus said that he who believes in him, mm -hmm. and, and by the way, believing in Jesus means to be living in mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm, that's good. He says that he who believes in him is not condemned, mm. but he who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And then he tells us in John 5, 24, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. Mm -hmm. By the way, hear means to put it into practice. And then he says, these shall not come into judgment, but have passed from death into life. So what is that saying? Our destiny is decided by us. Mm. Our mm. destiny is determined in our present life. Those in Christ will have their vindication at the judgment already assured. Those who are not in Christ will remain in under condemnation. And I have to make this one point. God does not arbitrarily choose who's going to be saved mm. or who's mm. going to be lost. That's First right. Timothy 2, 3 and 4 says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved mm -hmm. and to come to the knowledge of truth. Amen. 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 Yeah, I love that. The pre evident judgment, I'm James Rafferty, and I have Monday's lesson, is uh, for many people, it's, it's difficult. I mean, we sometimes think of it as, you know, that it's not good news, it's not part of the gospel, <laughs> and yet it is central to the gospel in Revelation right. chapter 14. Mm -hmm. The call for God's hour of judgment is really clear. So the concept of the judgment before Christ returns, or what we call the pre advent judgment, is found in many places in Scripture. I'm just going to give you a number of Scripture references that you can write down. Daniel 7, 9 through 14, Matthew 22, 1 through 14, Revelation 11, 1 and 18 and 19, Revelation 14, 6 and 7, the everlasting gospel. The question that's asked in the quarterly, the, the, the lesson for today is, how do these passages shed light on the notion of a pre-advent investigative judgment in the heavenly courtroom? And what is the, significant of, the significance of such mm. a judgment? Okay, so the, the author of the quarterly goes on to say that the concept of the judgment, the investigative judgment of God's people is grounded in three basic biblical teachings. Teaching mm. number one, one is the notion that all the dead, righteous or unrighteous, remain unconscious in their graves until the final resurrection. Of course, mm -hmm. that's based on some of Shelley's favorite scriptures, John chapter 5, 25 to 29, and many others. The second concept is the existence of a universal judgment of all human beings. And that's based on the 2 Corinthians 5, 10 text that we shared, and also on many others like Revelation 20, 11 through 13, and we'll look at a few others. The third is the fact that the first resurrection will be blessed, the blessed resurrection reward for the righteous, and the second resurrection will be the eternal death for the wicked, John 5, 28, 29, Revelation 20, uh, verses 4 through 6, and 12 through 15. What this means is that all human beings will be judged, or should be judged, prior to their 
respective resurrections because those resurrections, at those resurrections, they will receive the final rewards. So there has to be a judgment before the resurrection because when the resurrection comes, you receive your reward, both good or bad. The author goes on to say the book of Daniel helps us to understand both the time and the nature of the pre-advent judgment. At the time, the end of the 2300 symbolic days, or I should say prophetic days, that is literal years, in 1844, the heavenly sanctuary was to be cleansed. And that is synonymous with this pre-advent investigative judgment. The cleansing of the sanctuary in the Hebrew mindset was synonymous with judgment, a time of judgment and investigation. So this is two different ways of expressing the same event, the cleansing, the judgment, uh, judgment, is going to be made in favor of the saints of the Most Hallelujah. High. I love that. Mm -hmm. It's Amen. given to us. It's in favor mm -hmm. of us. The judge is on our side. The right. judgment is on our side. As believers, we don't need to be afraid of the judgment. The judgment God. is good news for believers. It Why would we be afraid of the judgment? Because God is on our side and He's there to vindicate us. He's there to clothe us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The only thing He wants us to do is give Him our sins. You know, in, in uh, Laodicea Church is told, don't cop out that you're rich and increased with good and needs of nothing. Mm -hmm. Buy of me. Give me your sins and I'll give you my righteousness. Mm -hmm. Buy of me that That's gold right. tried in the fire. Matthew 22, 1 through 14. We looked at that, talked about that. In the book of Revelation, the pre-advent investigative judgment is referred to by the task of measuring those who worship in the temple of God. Revelation 11, verse 1. The announcement also in Revelation 14, 6 is the hour of His judgment has come. Now, there's something here that's really important that I want to uh, emphasize uh, as a supplement to the quarterly, and that is Revelation 11, verse 1 does not only call us to be measured, that is the worshipers, but it also calls for a measuring of the temple and a measuring of the altar. That's why when you get to Revelation 14, 6 and 7, it's not just the hour of His judgment, in, in, for us, it's the hour of His judgment for God. Let me explain that. All of us are making a decision as to what kind of God we believe in. Mm. Mm -hmm. All, right. All of us are assessing God. And Stephen Haskell, great pioneer writer mm -hmm. in Adventism, wrote a book called The Seer of Patmos, and this is where this thought comes from. He uh, um, gives a commentary on, on Revelation 11, verse 1, and he says, you know, the temple of God is where God dwells, and the altar is where Christ was sacrificed. We are to measure God's character, and we are to measure the sacrifice Ooh, of God, hallelujah. and we will be measured in response to that. Mm. Everyone will be measured in how they relate or respond to what they've seen of God hey, and what man. they've seen of the cross. This is what Haskell brings out, and it's a beautiful concept, because sometimes we think about the judgment as all about us, but we need to remember <laughs> God's in it with us. That's right. Mary mm -hmm. Magdalene, wherever <laughs> she, the gospel was to be preached, which includes the judgment, Mary Magdalene's story was to be preached. And you know, when Mary Magdalene washed the feet of Christ with that anointing oil, the people that were around there said, this man, who was the person that was on the judging block first? Jesus was. This man, if he were a prophet, would have, and when Satan accuses us, which we see in Revelation 12, 10 and in Zechariah chapter 3, Satan is accusing us and he's also accusing God. How can you save these kinds of people? <laughs> How could you kick me out of heaven? What gives you the right to save them? What kind of justice is that? What kind of God are you? So every time we talk about the judgment, we need to see it in the context of God's character for this reason. That's what will motivate us. Mm. We're not going to be motivated to save ourselves in the end. In the end, we're going to be motivated about the character of God. We're going to be motivated about wanting to vindicate the God that we fall in love with and show to the world that He is a God of love. So the question of the judgment is primarily, what have we done with Jesus? What have we done with the sacrifice? How have we responded to God's love? You know, 1 Peter 4, 17 says, judgment must begin at the house of God. Mm. Matthew 12, 36 and 37 says, everyone must give an account, this is Jesus speaking, of every word, whether it's good or evil. And of course, Ecclesiastes 12, you know, the end of the whole matter is, you know, fear God and keep his commandments because God is going to bring every work mm -hmm. in the judgment, whether it's good or whether it's evil. So the Psalms, you know, we have this word that we're using, we've been using, investigative, investigative, investigative. Some people say, these Adventists, they're into this investigative judgment. That's not in the Bible. Oh, yes, it is. It's all through the Bible. If you go, but the word itself is there. If you go to Psalm 11, verse 4, and Psalm 26, verse 2, and Psalm 139, 23, and 24, and that's where we're going to land this plane. G 
David here is talking, and it's the same word used through all of these different Psalms, but in Psalm 139, 23, and 24, David is talking. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me. You know what that word try means? Try means in the Hebrew? Investigate, Investigate me. Yes. Yes. Investigate me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who, what believer in Jesus Christ as their righteousness does not want God to try them and investigate them and see if there be any wicked way in me verse 24, and lead me in the way everlasting. Lasting. That's what the investigative judgment is all about. Is there something wicked in me? Is there something in me that I need to give to Jesus? Is there some sin that needs to go beforehand to the judgment so it can be blotted out? God is not looking for an excuse to keep us out of heaven. That's not what the investigative judgment is about. God is looking to get rid of everything that would keep us out of heaven so that we can give it to Jesus and it can be blotted out. It can be forgiven and we can be led in the way everlasting. So the, the quarterly asked this question, how should our knowledge of the judgment have an impact, impact on how we live on this earth? And I'd like to suggest three ways. Way number one, because we find in Romans chapter 14 that Paul is talking about how we're all going to give an account before God. We all have to sit before the judgment seat of Christ. And so what he says in that context is stop judging each other. Right? Mm -hmm. Amen. There's some of you that are strong in the faith and there's some of you that are weak in the faith. Don't judge one another. Let every man Amen. be fully persuaded. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Practical application of how this should affect us. We don't judge other people anymore. Why? Mm -hmm. We're off the hook. Mm -hmm. We're off the hook. God has a judgment. Jesus has a judgment. Mm -hmm. He knows everything that's going on. He knows things we don't know and we'll never know and he's going right. to take care of it all. Reason number two is in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. We talked about this just a little bit, right? There are people who are just professors. You know, there are people who are, who are relying on their works. Well, they're not really in love with Jesus. They don't really have a heart. They don't know him, but they're saying, well, we're doing this and we're doing that. We cannot be saved by our works. Amen. We cannot mm -hmm. be saved by our righteousness. Reason number two is practical reason for the judgment. We've got to rely on Jesus. Amen. You know, when every work is brought into, into account, whether it's good or evil, we're going to see motives we never saw before. And we're going to have yeah. to say, Lord, please forgive me and save yeah. me and give me the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We are not saved by our works, but we're That's judged right. by our works mm -hmm. because our works tell us whether or not we put all of the weight mm -hmm. of our eternal salvation on Jesus or if we put part of it on ourselves. Mm -hmm. Reason number yeah. three, Revelation 12, 10. We talked about this just a little bit. And Zechariah 3, 1 through 5. Yeah. We have an accuser. God is not against us and Jesus is for us and Jesus is trying to convince the Father. You know, that's, that picture is all skewed. We're told that if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. Right. And he's advocating for us because we have an accuser that accuses us before God day and night. John chapter 14, verse 10, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yep. If I'm advocating for you, the Father is advocating for you, but <laughs> God is just. God is, God is not going to just ignore Satan. He's going to deal with Satan. Amen. And he's going he's to take into account everything Satan says about us, and it's nasty. Mm. And we've helped him, helped that report be nasty, but God is going to remember that Jesus Christ is our advocate, and he's going to look to where, like the thief on the cross, we've said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Amen. And when that judgment is set, and when those sins are blotted out, and when we finally realize realize the completeness of the, 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 the everlasting gospel, we are going to be settled. We're going to be sealed into the truth as we never have been before. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Amen. You know, Jesus said, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. He's already made that investigative judgment. Well, don't go away. We've got a lot more coming right up. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. We are now going to continue with Tuesday's lesson, and we have Pastor John Dinsey. Thank you, thank you. Uh, what a blessing to hear this uh, message on the pre-advent uh, pre judgment, the investigative judgment, excellent mm -hmm. material, and we hope that you have been keeping notes. My name is John Dinsey, and I am covering Tuesday, the millennial judgment. And in case that may be a new word for you, millennial, there are some uh, young people call millennial nowadays. 
Dr. Ryan Day preached about that. Uh, the millennium is a period of a thousand years. So we're talking about a period of a thousand years where there is judgment taking place. And the Bible explains who is doing this judgment. We are first going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. And the Bible tells us, For the Lord Himself will descend mm -hmm. from heaven mm -hmm. with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ mm -hmm. will rise first. This is not a time when the wicked are resurrected. This, this is the dead in Christ that rise first. Then we who are alive mm -hmm. and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. This is talking about the righteous. Those that are dead are resurrected and those that are righteous living uh, are together caught up in the air to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, we shall always be with the Lord. This takes us into the, uh, the judgment called the millennial judgment uh, by the lesson in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 through 4. I'd like to bring that out now to get um, a glimpse of what takes place. We begin in verse 1, Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. This is why you have the phrase millennium, millennial. The word millennium does not appear in the Bible, but this is what we call it, a millennium. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him uh, so that he should deceive the nations no more mm. till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And it's interesting that he is released after a little while. You can keep reading in Revelation 20. And he begins his activity right where he left them. There's no change in him. And were he to live forever and ever, he will not change. Mm -hmm. He is committed to wickedness and he is just wanting to deceive as many as possible. And verse 4 brings to light that which is who is doing the judgment along with uh, the Lord. And I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. So what you have here is the saints that were resurrected and were taken to heaven. They participate in the judgment. They go over the record books to see what is written there. And we have to highlight again what Sister um, Shelley said about those that are there are there because of the grace and mercy of God. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 4 Chapter 2, actually, beginning in verse 4, says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love, wherewith He loved us, mm -hmm. even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. And then uh, verse 7 and 8 says, That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us, through Christ Jesus, for by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's a gift by grace, and it is uh, it, and it's not of ourselves. It's not by works, mm -hmm. as you continue reading. It's not by works. So we see here that those that are there are there because of the grace of God. What about those that are not there? Why aren't they there? Mm -hmm. Proverbs 28, verse 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall mm. not prosper. Mm -hmm. but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them mm -hmm. shall have mercy. These people, the righteous, have uh, confessed their sins, forsaken their sins by the grace of God, and they're following the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we praise the Lord that there is mercy available to everyone. That's right. Mercy is available to all. Amen. This is why you have the message uh, of the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he, be, mm -hmm. that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So it is a message for everyone. Mm -hmm. Everyone can have that mercy, mm -hmm. but not all accept it. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 and 3 
uh, explains to us again about the judgment. Do you not know that the mm -hmm. saints will judge the world? The saints will judge the world. And if the world be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So the saints, they go to heaven, do some judging. Who are they judging? Well, they're judging the wicked. They're looking over the record books because, you know, some of us have seen people along our lives and we say, wow, that, that, that sister Ethel there, she's a wonderful Christian. Surely she's going to be in heaven. Mm. And then we're shocked. Where's sister Ethel? Wow, she's a wonderful Christian. Looking for her, but couldn't, can't find her. And then the records reveal, oh no, she was stealing. She was doing all kinds of wicked things and she's not here because of that. And the records are... are, are exact and pure. Remember, we were, it was brought out that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Mm -hmm. And those that have not confessed and forsaken, they do not have the mercy because they did not ask for the mercy. Mm. In Revelation chapter 20, uh, we're going to go to verse 11 through 13. And it says here, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. So the record books reveal what the works were of those that were not saved. They are judged according to the book, as was brought up by mm -hmm. Pastor James. And so we have here that there is a book of life also. And mm -hmm. if your name is not in the book of life, then you cannot go to heaven. You cannot live eternally. Verse 13 says, The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, were in them and they were judged, each one according to his, work. his works. So what is this about works? And what is this about why are people judged mm -hmm. by works? Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible tells us that God's commandments are the standard of judgment. Everyone is judged by how they reacted to God's commandments. Mm -hmm. We are told that uh, God's commandments in James chapter 2, it says that these, this is the law of liberty. Mm -hmm. This is the law of liberty. And those that uh, live in harmony to the Ten Commandments, they're walking in liberty because by the grace of the Lord, they are living in harmony with the commandments. They love God and they love their fellow man and woman. <laughs> I'm going to read from the lesson uh, some points brought out here. The whole judgment process is intended, number one, to vindicate God's character against the accusations of Satan that God is unfair in the way he treats his creatures. So this judgment process vindicates God's character. Mm -hmm. Number two, to confirm the impartiality of the rewards of the righteous. Uh, that's number two. Number three, um, to demonstrate the justice of the punishment of the wicked. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible says uh, to us uh, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that God is not willing that any should perish, mm -hmm. but that all should come to repentance. And it is a sad, sad thing, you know, when mm -hmm. you start and you stop and think and analyze, mm -hmm. you know, what is the devil offering people? The devil's offering people, uh, have fun, hurt yourself, hurt other people, and then you are going to have to face the judgment and you're going to pay for your sins. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. But what does God offer? The gift of God is eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ. And God has the best offer. I now have to read number four brought out in the lesson. It says, to dissipate all doubts that could lead toward another rebellion mm -hmm. in That's the good. universe. Mm -hmm. So the millennial judgment clears the record. All questions are answered. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, we don't have time to read it. I'm sure somebody will bring it out. God will wipe away all tears from our mm -hmm. eyes. Uh, it, it, you see that in Revelation chapter 20, it brings out what happens to the wicked. They are cast into the lake of fire. And the Bible calls this the second death. Because the wages of sin is death. And eventually, those thrown there, they die. They are not punished throughout eternity because mm -hmm. God is a just and fair God. Mm -hmm. No one will be punished one second more than they deserve, nor one second less than they deserve. So in Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, and it says concerning God, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. I encourage you to 
follow Jesus and by his grace, keep his commandments. Mm. Mm. Amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor Denzi. Appreciate that as well. My name is Ryan Day and I have Wednesday's lesson entitled The Executive Judgment. And uh, I'm going to jump right into it. I like the way the lesson uh, brings out a nice introduction to this topic. It says, during the Middle Ages, there was a strong tendency to portray God as a severe punitive judge. Uh, today, the tendency is to describe him as a loving, permissive father <laughs> who never punishes his children. <laughs> That's pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes on to say, yet love without justice will turn into chaos and lawlessness mm -hmm. and justice without love mm -hmm. will become oppression and subjugation. Mm -hmm. God's judging process is a perfect blend of justice and mercy, mm -hmm. both of which derive from his unconditional love. I think that was worded very mm -hmm. well. Yeah, and, and I love that line there. Yet with, it says, yet love without justice will turn into chaos and lawlessness and justice without love will become oppression mm -hmm and subjugation. So my friends, we have to, we have to find that proper balance. And mm. when we're talking about the executive judgment, okay, Pastor Denzi mentioned it a little bit, and I know that Jill is going to go into the details as to what that looks like in reference to the second death. But the executive judgment, some people can't envision God bringing justice upon people because the idea, again, like it brought out in, in the lesson here, mm -hmm. many, many people's today's, uh, many, many uh, of today's uh, opinions are that, you know what, God loves everyone, you know, and, and yes, the, he did die on the cross. Yes, he did give, give himself for us so that he can save uh, as many people as possible. But, you know, they can't imagine that God is going to bring an actual executive or executive judgment down upon people uh, who did not receive him or who were lost, and so you know, I you know, I remember this when I was a, when I was a kid. Um, you know, just, there's many stories I could tell of this. I, I had a wonderful upbringing, and my parents, of course, just like most parents, weren't perfect in every little decision and action that they made. But mm. I had great parents, and uh, and you know, the, my my parents, you know, they they. Were, were rough when they needed to be rough to bring the judgment that needed to be brought and yet mm -hmm. they also were loving and, and compassionate and merciful when that needed as well. Well, I remember a particular story, you know, I was, I can't remember, I was in elementary and uh, I was a pretty good student. I was an AB student most of the time and I always was in the homework club and I did all my homework and I was a, I was a decent student. And, uh, but there was this one particular year, I just got lazy mm -hmm. and uh, the first semester had passed and the teacher had given me an envelope one day and she said, send this home to your parents. It had, my, it had parents of Ryan Day on it. She said, my teacher said, make sure your parents get this, that they see it and that they sign it. And I want you to return this to me with their signature on it. Well, I didn't know what was inside this, uh, you know, because, you, you know, parents would receive progress reports. But, you know, I, I didn't, it even, didn't even click with me what this was. So I took it home to my mom and dad. I gave it to my dad. My dad opens it up and he looks at this progress report. And of course, it showed that I had been lazy. I had not been really been a good student and I was significant significantly um, failing in one of my classes. And mm -hmm. so my dad brought me in the room. He said, son, what's this right here? Uh, teacher here says you have this grade and it's, you know, and so he knew, my dad knew I could perform better than that. He knew that I was a better student than that. He knew what I was capable of. In fact, my teacher knew that as well. And she wrote a letter home saying, we know Ryan is capable and better, you know, capable of better work than this. You know, my dad could have easily done what some parents do today and, you know, went to the teacher and said, how dare you say this thing about my son? My son's a, a good boy and my son would never, surely you're the one with the problem. You know, mm. no, my dad knew I had had a good teacher. He trusted the teacher's judgment and, and he came to me. He said, son, what's this? And uh, I remember him telling me, saying, um, you've got nine weeks. I've talked to your teacher. You've got nine weeks to get this grade up. And so, uh, you know, he, he signed the letter, turned, returned it back. And, you know, week after week, he would ask, did you do your homework? Did you do this? Did you do that? God, you know, my dad showed me mercy. He could have punished mm -hmm. me for having the bad grade, but he showed me mercy for nine weeks. I didn't take it serious. I didn't take it very serious. That, that mid-semester uh, progress report Ooh. came after nine weeks and I still had a bad grade. And uh, well, let's just say the wrath of daddy <laughs> came down on Ryan. And, uh, and, and, you know, he took away my, you know, I had a little video game system. He took, and I liked to play it every once in a while and I loved basketball. He mm. took away my basketball and I couldn't have those things and I got punished in more ways than one. 
<laughs> for nine weeks. Mm. And now some people are probably yelling at the TV screen right now. going, Oh, some parents today. Oh, how horrible, how treacherous of a punishment. That's <laughs> abuse. How dare you do that? Mm. You know, but at the end of the day, my friends, you know, God is, is very similar in the sense that he, his mercy is endures mm -hmm. forever. He is so long suffering. He's so patient. He's so kind. He loves us so much. But yet the Bible gives us many examples where his judgment does come. His executive mm -hmm. judgment does come. The executive judgment of God's final and irreversible punitive intervention in human history. This is what the lesson brings out. It's uh, the limited punitive judgments occur, for example, and the, the lesson brings out, you know, the casting out of Satan and his rebellious angels mm -hmm. from heaven. Go read. If you haven't, if you don't have this book in your library, get it. Patriarchs and Prophets. <laughs> Go get the book. Read the first chapter of Patriarchs mm -hmm. and Prophets. It's entitled Why Sin Was per Why Was Sin yeah. Permitted? Powerful chapter. Mm -hmm. it, it reveals how God was so mm -hmm. long suffering. He was so patient. He was so merciful on, on Lucifer. He begged Lucifer, and we don't know exactly how much time, but you could imagine, mm -hmm. you know, in t you know, eternity's past, you know, in these, in, you know, these beings that are receiving immortality from God. You know, in this case, there, God was patient with them. He was long suffering, and he begged Lucifer and gave Lucifer time to repent and to turn from his evil ways. But his pride and his yeah. continuous rebellion rebellion mm. led God to have to finally make a decision mm. in casting him out, driving Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. Mm. Adam and Eve were perfect beings. They'd never sinned. They didn't have mm -hmm. a, a fallen sinful nature when God had created them. Mm -hmm. the, you know, we were told that the, the angels worked with them each day and taught them. Jesus walked with them and taught them each day of the plan of salvation and of the wicked one's schemes and lies and the rebellion in heaven. They were familiar with all of this stuff, yeah. but yet they still brought themselves to the point where they saw, you know, the, the truth of God that God had given to them. They had that there, but yet they still chose to rebel or they still chose mm -hmm. against God. In this case, God had to bring a judgment down upon them. Mm. Um, I'm looking at also the great flood in Genesis. Mm. Yes. The great flood, my goodness, we're talking nearly 2,000 years of God just you know, patiently waiting and waiting mm -hmm. and sending mm -hmm. His prophets, sending His messengers. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were men that walked in those days that were there to talk to Adam, who were mm -hmm. there, who saw Adam and Eve, and they mm -hmm. knew the story. They knew of what God mm -hmm. expected of them, that yet, you know, the, the great flood had to be brought in mm -hmm. order to bring proper justice. You know, I can go on and on with all these different examples. Sodom and Gomorrah, my yeah. goodness. I mean, what you read right there in the 18th chapter of Genesis where God is just, or, or Abraham is pleading mm -hmm. with Jesus, oh, what if, you, what if you find 50? What if you find 40? What if you find 30? He goes all the way down. What if you find 10 righteous people? And the merciful, loving, kind yeah. God says, if I find 10 righteous people in this mm -hmm. wicked, horrible city, I'll save it. Mm -hmm. He couldn't find 10. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, there had to be a judgment brought down. We see in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, mm. but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. If God mm. didn't spare those, my friend, what makes you think that down here at the end of time, he's just going to let sin yeah. continue on? Mm. Sin must come to an end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And God's response to that, God's final, I guess, hammer of judgment, if you want to say, I don't know if that's the appropriate word, but drawing the line in the sand and saying no more, mm -hmm. God has to bring this executive judgment. And of course, we're going to learn about this more in just a moment from Jill as she goes into detail. But, uh, you know, Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, my goodness. Every time I read this text... I don't know what God's voice sounds like. Mm. You know, I've never heard mm. the audible yes. voice of God. But I could just sense love coming from this. Mm. Saying to them in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, As I live, says the Lord yes. God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, mm -hmm. but that the wicked mm. turn from his way and live. And then you could just sense just this, the love and, the, and, the, and this, mm -hmm. this, the love pouring from him. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why should you die 
And so I want to read this last one here, the time I have. This comes from Manuscripts Released, Volume 12, page 208. It says, God's goodness and long forbearance, His patience and mercy exercised to His subjects will not hinder Him from punishing the sinner who refused to be obedient to His requirements. Mm. It is not for a man, a criminal against God's holy law, pardoned only through the great sacrifices He made in giving His Son to die for the guilty because His law was changeless, to mm. dictate to God. My friends, we have to put our trust into the Lord mm. and understand that His His ways are higher than our ways. Mm. And His love is so sufficient. If only we would just trust in Him, believe in His Word, and as we learned here, ask Lord, what is there in my life mm -hmm. that needs to be taken away? I want nothing separating me mm -hmm. from God Almighty and His eternal love. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor mm -hmm. Ryan, each one of you. Um, my name is Jill Morricone. I have Thursday's lesson, which is the second death. And Ryan set that up so beautifully. I want to start with a scripture that's almost identical to the one you ended with. You read Ezekiel 33. I'm going to do Ezekiel 18. But it's really the right. almost identical right. word because the executive judgment, which is really the judgment of the wicked, and I'm looking at the second death. It's a heavy topic. Mm -hmm. You can't get around it. It is a heavy topic. And leading into it, I wanted to read that Ezekiel 18. Mm. It's almost identical to what Ryan just read. If you pick up partway through verse 30, repent turn from your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Mm -hmm. Cast away from you all the transgressions you've committed. Get yourselves a new heart and a new mm -hmm. spirit. For why should you die? Mm -hmm. O house of Israel, I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord. Therefore, turn and live. Yes. This is the call. We see the patience of God. We see the mercy of God. We see His long suffering through 6,000 years of sin, 6,000 years of suffering, 6,000 years of pain. God bore long, Lucifer, Adam and Eve, by extension, all of us, mm -hmm. allowing the outworking of the great controversy, allowing the outworking of sin, but eventually, God is love, and love is love, but love also has justice. Mm -hmm. That's what we sure. see with the second death. So let's look at, I divided it into four characteristics or components of the second death. We're going to take a look at that. We're going to read first some verses Pastor Johnny read. Let's read Revelation 20. We're going to pick it up in verse 9, partway through verse 9. Revelation 20, verse 9. Component number one or characteristic number one. The second death is the extermination of the wicked. To me, that's as simple as you can put it. It's mm. the final, complete, irreversible extermination of the wicked. Mm -hmm. We see this in Revelation 29. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Mm -hmm. The devil, we see the devil's not exempt from this process. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Jump down to verse 14. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Takeaway number one, this is as we're looking at the extermination of the wicked. God brings the destruction. Mm. I know there's people today that say, and there's people in our church mm -hmm. who say, well, God doesn't kill. Right. <laughs> God doesn't bring destruction. Mm. God's not going to cause that. That's not going to happen. But it's very clear. Fire came down from God. It didn't come from any other source. Mm -hmm. It came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Love is also justice. Mm -hmm. And God is executing justice at this point. I want to be clear, the wicked have already made their choice, mm -hmm. clearly. They have turned against God. Mm -hmm. They have turned, closed the door of mercy to their heart. And to be honest, if they had a second chance, they'd still turn against God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They would not say, oh, just give me one more chance and I'll serve you. No, they spit in his face. Mm -hmm. God brings the destruction. Takeaway number two, all the wicked, including Satan and his angels, they're destroyed. We see this in verse 15. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. There's not a few people left over. There's not God saying, okay, well, you're not so bad. Only the really wicked are going. No, everyone. The second death, this judgment, 
everyone who has turned their back on God mm -hmm. and whose names are not found in the book of life, they will be destroyed. Take away three. The punishment is not forever. It is simply complete, final, and irrevocable. It is complete and total destruction. We've discussed this mm. in previous lessons, the lake of fire. It's not literally burning forever and ever. It just means complete and total destruction. Malachi 4 verse 1, we reference this on a previous lesson. Mm. Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. Mm -hmm. God's destruction is so Complete. It's so total that right. nothing left remains. Mm -hmm. Everything is completely gone. Isaiah 34 talks about the destruction of Edom compared to a final destruction of the wicked. If you read Isaiah 34, Edom, it doesn't burn forever, but it conveys that concept that the fire will never go out until there's nothing left to burn. Right. Again, right. it just means literally until it is burned up. Mm -hmm. It is completely mm -hmm. consumed. So the second death, the first characteristic is simply the destruction of the wicked. God brings that destruction. The destruction is not forever. It is complete and total until everything is gone. Then we look at the second component. This is the destruction of sin is forever. Now you might be saying, wait a minute, I just thought you said, it. no, that was the wicked. Right. The wicked are destroyed, but we're talking about sin now. Nahum 1, 9. Mm, yes. What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise a second yes. time. That's the second characteristic to me of the second death, meaning sin's not gonna happen again. Right. Sin is forever destroyed. It is yes. forever eradicated. Takeaway number four, never again will we experience the results of sin. You know, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get tired of this world, right? Mm -hmm. Ooh, there's sin and there's destruction and there's famine and there's pain and suffering and mm -hmm. sorrow, mm -hmm. but that will be over forever. Never again to rise. Mm -hmm. The second death, when that takes place, never again, Great Controversy 504, never will evil again be manifest. Mm. A tested and proved creation will never again be turned from allegiance to God, whose character has been fully manifested before them as fathomless love and infinite wisdom. Mm. Characteristic number three of the uh, second death is eternal separation from God. Second Thessalonians 1 verse 9. It says these, uh, these are those who don't know God, those who don't obey the gospel of Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction mm. from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You notice they're punished. Mm -hmm. There's the destruction, mm -hmm. the second death, but it's separated forever right. Right. from the presence of the Lord. That's right. Takeaway number five, Jesus tasted the second death and the separation from his father, so you and I don't have to do mm. that. He experienced separation from his father at the cross. Mm -hmm. Psalm 22, this is that messianic psalm. What did he say in Psalm 22, verse one? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Experiencing that separation from the father when the cloud enveloped Jesus at the cross and that darkness was there and he could not sense his father's presence. Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? And finally, characteristic number four, the second death we experience the curse of sin. Mm. Matthew 25, Shelley, you talked about that. Matthew 25, 41. Then he would say to those on the left hand, this is the goats, depart from me, you, what's the word? Cursed mm -hmm. into everlasting fire. This is talking about the second death. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Final takeaway, number six. Jesus tasted that second death and he tasted the curse of sin, so you and I don't have to. Mm. Galatians yep. three thirteen. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Right. 
So those characteristics, again, those components of the second death, it's extermination of the wicked, and this comes from God. It is complete, total, irreversible, burned up until there is nothing left. It is the destruction, not just of the wicked, but of sin forever. There will be no more sin. Amen. Affliction will not rise a second time. It is for the wicked, eternal separation from God. Mm. And they experience the curse, the final curse there mm -hmm. of sin. So go back to Ezekiel 18. We don't have to experience the second death. None of us do. We have a choice and he looks at us, God looks at us and says, while there is yet time, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, but turn to him and live. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jill and Ryan and Johnny and James. Mm -hmm. This has been such a beautiful lesson. Mm -hmm. And what we'd like to do now is just get a quick closing thought from each of you. Well, in the investigative judgment, when it comes to our works, we need to look to Paul who said, not as though I'd attained or already perfect, but I pressed toward the mark. But when it comes to our salvation, we need to look to the thief on the cross who had nothing to offer, but simply said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I am reading from the lesson. It says, this process of the millennial judgment provides an opportunity for the saints to evaluate the heavenly records to see God's fair treatment in all cases. God is marvelous and loving. He will treat everyone fair. Amen. You know, my father, it hurt him to have to punish me. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, he saw that if I continued on down that road without being awakened, that I was heading to my demise, at least in my education. And so in this case, my friends, our father is the same way, our heavenly father. Mm -hmm. uh, he brings judgment because he loves us and because he must deal with sin. Mm -hmm. God is love. God is mercy. God is long suffering. And love is also justice. Mm -hmm. We see that clearly conveyed in the Word of God. Amen. amen and amen. I want to read something to you from the Sabbath School Quarterly. It says, in the end, the judgment is not the time when God decides to accept or reject us, but the time when God finalizes our choice, mm, whether good. or not we have accepted him, a choice made manifest by our works. We hope today Today is the day of salvation. We hope you will turn and choose God. And we hope you'll join us next time for our final lesson of the quarter, All Things New. God bless. Mm -hmm.